without much further ado, I'll call on the first speaker, the first keynote speaker of today, Dr. Vincent Lowe, Chairman of Shreon Group, also Chairman of my Leadership and Public Policy Program. Dr. Lowe. Um, President Chen, Vice Chancellor Hamilton, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm delighted to attend the launch program of the uh, Oxford UST Leadership and Public Series <coughs> uh, Policy Series. Uh, I haven't commented on Hong Kong's politics for quite some time now, but today I've decided to be brave. I'm going to talk about Hong Kong politics, what has gone wrong. I know I'm be asking for trouble, but I thought it's important for me to address this issue because Hong Kong is facing a very critical juncture in our political and democratic development. And I think it would be helpful for me to try and take stock of where we are now. I have very limited time, so I will not beat around the bush or mince my words. First, our economy. Hong Kong is increasingly being marginalized as a result of the rapid changes around us, generating deep-seated political, social, economic problems. Uh, former Premier Wen Jiabao first coined the term deep contradictions, to describe Hong Kong's situation. And as Professor Richard Wong of Hong Kong University elegantly puts it, the source of Hong Kong's deep contradictions arises from Hong Kong's dual integration process, which refers to, and I quote him, the product of having to adjust from being integrated with the global market economy to being integrated with both the mainland and the global market economy. Resourceful big companies from Hong Kong do well in adapting to these changes. Many ride the tides and scale new heights, expanding into the Chinese mainland markets and overseas. But the story is not quite the same for the SMEs. The small and medium-sized enterprises, typically they lack the resources or the expertise to tap into the China market effectively. And for those who are in the manufacturing and have managed to capture the opportunities in the Pearl River Delta, they are now facing acute problem of rising costs in the PRD. And the difficult choice of whether to close shops or to move further inland or find cheaper production base for themselves and relocation could be a very expensive exercise. And for those in the service sector who have been supporting the manufacturing activities in the PRD, they are facing the same difficult choice. If the manufacturing activities move inland, should they follow? And it, will it be feasible for them to service a base much further away from Hong Kong? While all these challenges present themselves, we, Hong Kong, has failed to diversify our economy. Our manufacturing industries managed to delay the sunset by moving to the PRD in the 80s and the 90s. But our pillar sectors today, all service-driven, has remained the same for more than 20 years, with their competitive advantages gradually eroding. While we store, mainland cities are fast catching up. There are other competitors in the region, Singapore, Taiwan, just to name two obvious choice. We have lost our few good factor, not just because of the intense competition. Closer to home, the widening gap of the rich and poor has taken away much of the gloss of our economic achievements. It tucks my heart to see many young people having to struggle and without much hope that they will live a better life than their parents. University graduates' starting pay levels are largely stagnant for over a decade now. Many do not earn more than 10,000 a month in their first jobs. Private housing is simply unaffordable. There is no more myth of rags to riches. 
Some turn radical in their political views. Many more become despondent, disengaged. Why bother if you can't get, um, even if you work your socks off, more than a cubicle where you cannot even stretch your feet? We read in the newspaper that many university students are quietly applying for public housing, joining the queue of over 200,000 families. We cannot and should not blame them. The phenomenon tells us that the situation in Hong Kong is turning negative for the young people. There is therefore little surprise that some young people vent their anger by blaming their bleak life prospects on what they see as the influx of mainland immigrants and visitors. Many mainland immigrants are low-skill, low-income workers coming to Hong Kong for a family reunion, and they struggle because of the high cost of living here. They need social economic support in terms of housing, education, and other welfare provisions, taking an increasingly bigger share of our financial and land resources. The rise in the number of immigrants is a product of Hong Kong's social integration with the mainland after China's opening up. But many locals are worried that the welfare, education, medical, and social service system simply could not be sustained if this trend continues. Especially after the recent decision by the Court of Final Appeal regarding new immigrants' right to claim benefits, these are genuine worries. And the opinion in some quarters of our society have turned against the new mainland immigrants and, and visitors, showing worrying signs of xenophobia and isolationism. Mainland visitors are seen as coming to Hong Kong to buy up all our milk powder and occupy all the back spaces in the maternity wards. Or when they're not competing with the locals for these goods and services, they are simply everywhere, making locals feel that the city is no longer their own. While the business sector see the mainland visitors as customers, some residents regard them as intruders. But many people's livelihood depends on the retail and tourism trade here in Hong Kong, close to half a million. And we cannot just turn the mainland visitors away, but then we also need to find solutions to cope with the ever-increasing number of visitors. We cannot and should not allow the problem to get out of hand. And the resentment that will continue to grow if nothing is done about it. And that is not good for the future of Hong Kong. It is a shame that little has been done so far. And this list of problems can go on. What can the government do in view of all these cha challenges? The government must be able to do something, we used to think. The somewhat cynical view is that at least the government could head off to Beijing to ask for help whenever there are crises in Hong Kong. But while the central government remains supportive to Hong Kong, the mainland public opinion has changed somewhat. There is resentment in certain quarters that Hong Kong is not trying hard enough to help itself, that Hong Kong has become complacent and we just rely on Beijing to bail us out every time. There is also resentment that Hong Kong people have failed to develop a national identity. All these negative sentiments on the mainland could tie the hands of the central government when they contemplate providing further help to Hong Kong in the future. Did Hong Kong and our government try hard enough to break new grounds in our developments and pull ourselves out of these doldrums? Yes and no, if you ask me. There have been some attempts to find new directions. The government can try and do more, but it is subject to a lot of restraints. Yes, first, how do you solve the conundrum of the civil service? In the past, we all believed that Hong Kong succeeded in its governance because of the fine civil service. And the civil service has been praised by many and recognized to be one of the best in the world. But not long after 1997, the prevailing theory at the time was that we failed because of the civil servants. It is basically the same civil service. Why the sudden change of perception? No matter which saying is true, 
and maybe they are both true under different circumstances. One must admit that we might have been a bit too optimistic back in the 1980s when we were drafting the basic law. We believed naively at that time that there would not be much politics in Hong Kong after 1997 because the civil servants would take care of it all and run the government like before. It was not entirely fair to the civil service that we had such unrealistic assumptions and high expectations. The politicized atmosphere in Hong Kong today proves us wrong, quite wrong really, and it shows the ignorance of many of us on our poor understanding of politics and democracies back then. We wrote an executive-led <coughs> political system into our basic law, buttressing it with the civil service, but it rings hollow in the face of an elected legislature. Now we all come to realize that a chief executive who does not have any secure vote in the legislature will find the system difficult, if not unworkable at times. The executive legislature relationship is the crux of our structural problem concerning governance. Even if we elect the future chief executive by universal franchise, he or she may still not have the support in the legislature as the CE would not have a ruling party to govern with him. And the basic law does not allow the CE to be a member of any political party. The current debate about the 217 CE election method, it is important, but even if we can find a new election method supported by most, it will not be a panacea unless we can find the key to unlock the executive legislature stalemate. With the adversarial political environment in Hong Kong today, many in the business and professional communities who used to provide support to the government through public service also find it increasingly untenable to carry on what they have been doing for decades. It used to be an honor to serve on government bodies and many genuinely believe that their public service position is a way to pay back to society and it is also a recognition of their standing in society and achievements. But because of the highly politicized atmosphere, many stand back or withdraw from public service. Those who are still serving try to lie low. It is a shame, frankly. We run the risk of losing the social capital contributed by many talented and dedicated people. To sum up, our institutional setups some enshrined in the basic law, some long, long embedded in our systems, look increasingly unsustainable and could not cope with the rapid economic, social and political changes after 1997. We must recognize that we will have to change, otherwise we'll be changed by external forces. We are already being reshaped by the dual integration process. The choice we have is whether we want to take our fate in our own hands. I do believe <clears throat> we are at a critical juncture in Hong Kong's future. It appears that every day we're dragging ourselves further down the tube. <coughs> Excuse me. One wonders. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. One wonders whether it is too late to turn the tide. I do not have the answer but I do think that there are some important considerations that we must look at while we wrestle with all the critical and difficult issues facing Hong Kong. First, I think we need to go back to our fine tradition of pragmatism. We need to set realistic targets for ourselves and strike a balance among different aspirations and goals. For example, it is a common view now that we need more land for housing but we cannot say we need more land and then reject all the practical solutions to create land. No more reclamation, no development in the new territories northeast, no encroachment into our natural habitat. Country parks <coughs> are important, <coughs> but if you ask someone living in a small rented cubicle, the answer will be quite different. 
All these no's make it impossible to find enough land to satisfy the housing needs and aspirations, and we need to find a compromise quickly. Politics is all about compromise, give and take, in the positive sense. No one wins all, and no winner should take all. Genuine com compromises do not just ask one side to give, but all sides, so that all can take. We desperately need a broader agenda, and housing should not be the only one item on our agenda, but it should be one of the top. A broad agenda should include, for instance, ways to improve our economic competitiveness, deliver adequate housing, improve the environment, further sharpening our education system, encourage entrepreneurship and new industries, just to name a few. Formulating a broad agenda in itself is a process of compromise, as no one should dominate the agenda by only having their own pet projects on the list. We need to fight poverty, but it should not be the only item. We need to grow the economy, but it should not be the only game. To formulate such an agenda, we need a workable political system. Will democracy, particularly Western-style democracy, be the solution? Democracy must be part of the solution, but it will not be a cure for all. In our circumstances, as discussed a few minutes ago, universal franchise alone will not solve all the problems. Not even a popularly elected CE would have the magic wand to resolve the challenges arising from the dual integration process. Democracies are under intense challenges in other cities, in other countries as well, in the US and Europe, in many parts in Asia, such as Thailand, um, Taiwan, in Eastern Europe, like Ukraine, and other parts of the world too, look at um, Turkey last year. In those countries, democratic elections alone do not solve all the institutional and leadership problems. Like us, these countries also have complex show-show tensions, of, uh, uh, complex show-show fabrics, and they are also facing social and economic tensions arising from the same forces of globalization and all the rapid changes that come with it. How far should we go in our democratic development and how quick? Hong Kong is not a sovereign state. We operate under one country, two system. These are important issues that we need to ponder in a pragmatic manner, accommodating different views with the aim to achieving a workable compromise. A confrontational win-all or lose-all approach would not help. When we try to chart the way forward, I hope the different camps will not adopt a zero-sum game. In the past 20 minutes or so, if I managed to crystallize somewhat the core issues concerning Hong Kong's politics and shed some light on the questions of what went wrong, I would be much gratified. I dare not try to provide solutions, and one man's view would not suffice in the face of the enormity of all the existing problems facing Hong Kong. I just hope that the process of frank soul-searching, open-minded discussion, and vigorous search for solutions will continue it is only through such process that we stand a chance of eventually finding a way out for Hong Kong. And that is why I've supported the HAUSD in establishing this leadership and public policy executive education program. Thank you very much.